This is your complete guide to the updated SKR Mini E3 version 2. The Big Tree Tech SKR Mini E3 is a wildly popular mainboard that's a direct swap for the Ender 3 as well as supported for the Ender 5 and original CR10. Given its budget price and range of features, I still believe it's the best bang for buck modification you can make for your Ender 3. Previously I've covered version 1 and 1.2 and they worked quite well but now we have version 2.0 and I feel it's a more mature project and it squashed some of the bugs that blighted the other two boards. In this video, I'm going to explain what the board is, how to install it, and then take you through step by step on how to set it up to utilize the full range of features as well as accessories. Let's start by covering exactly what this product is. The Big Tree Tech SKR Mini E3 is an affordable 32 bit mainboard that's designed to be a drop in replacement for the Ender 3, Ender 5, and original CR10. Furthermore, they have TMC2209 stepper motor drivers, so they're just as quiet as a Creality Silent board, but overall this board is superior, being 32-bit, as well as more affordable. The board is open source, and on the Big Tree Tech GitHub, there's an outstanding range of resources, including firmware and a quite detailed instruction manual. This means it's easy to get dimensions, pinouts, as well as instructions on how to fit a range of various accessories. Here's a brief summary of why I think this is such good value. There's no bootloader required if you want to update the firmware. It will come with thermal runaway protection and other modern safety features. It has a 32-bit processor, so it's future-proofed. It supports a wide range of accessories. The TMC2209 stepper motor drivers remove surface artifacts. This board will make your printer very quiet. <laughs> and it's only 35 US dollars, significantly cheaper than the Creality offering. So what's changed in the new version of this board? There's a nice summary of changes on the Big Tree Tech website, but let's have a look at the actual board. As you can see, the boards still have the same footprint, so this is still a bolt-in replacement. The heated bed MOSFET is significantly bigger and should run cooler. The five volt regulator is also beefier, there's more copper layers in the actual PCB and on the underside you can see an increased focus on cooling through these thermal pads. Overall this board should run much cooler. The servo and probe ports have been combined and rotated 90 degrees over on the right. There's ports to plug in the new DC-DC power module. If you're running a large amount of 5 volt devices such as a long string of NeoPixels this will provide more current reliably. It's the same concept as the accessory available for the SKR version 1.4. One thing missing is the jumper to switch between spread cycle and stealth chop, but instead we have jumpers to enable sensorless homing more easily. There's also now a dedicated EEPROM chip on board. Previously this had to be emulated or saved to the SD card. There's two ports for the Z axis. A change that you won't see is a difference in how the UART of the 2209s connects. And one other really nice touch is that a second fan port is now controllable by PWM. By default, that means the cooling for the main board is switched on and off as needed, and that makes for an overall quieter printer. The version 2 comes with the same processor as the version 1.2. This model is meant to have less flash space, but as it turned out for the version 1.2, the version 2 works with the full 512 kilobytes of program space. So how do we go about installing this main board? As this board has the same footprint and mounting holes, you can print out this guide and then label all of the wires with masking tape. And then you put in the new board and plug everything back into the same place. It's really straightforward, but in case you're worried, I've updated my wiring guide and the links for both of these pictures are in the description. If your main board was still in the factory location, the new one will fit in there just fine. If you're running my universal rear-mounted electronics case, it can be a little bit hard to reach the left-hand side of the board, so I've just made a simple remix. Since we don't need TL smoothers, it shifts the mounting for this board further to the right for easier access. The link to download these parts is in the description. 
A very valid question is whether this board is configured correctly out of the box. I left my BL touch disconnected and instead plugged back in the factory Z end stop. Connecting via Pronterface, I saw that the firmware that came on the board was a recent version of Marlin 2.0 bug fix, and this was confirmed by the readout from the About Printer info on the LCD. I then selected a quick and useful print that I could use repeatedly while making this video. I loaded up the G-code for the clip and did a little bit of live leveling as the print started. At this stage, everything appeared to be working properly, the motors were moving in the right direction, the bed was set up for the correct size, and all of the heaters and fans were working well. 15 minutes later, I had my completed print, and all is well for the base setup on an Ender 3 or Ender 3 Pro. Earlier in the terminal, I noticed the setup information for the automatically controlled electronics enclosure fan. I was keen to observe this, and as you can see, it's idle when nothing's moving, but as soon as the stepper motors are needed, the fan springs to life, and one minute after the steppers aren't being used, the fan will automatically shut down. For an Ender 3, it was perfect out of the box, but what if we have another printer, or we want to make some firmware customization? On the Big Tree Tech GitHub, there's a fork of the Marlin branch already configured for this board for the Ender 3 but I prefer to and strongly recommend using the main Marlin branch to make sure everything's up to date. Fortunately, I noticed a couple of weeks ago that in the example configurations for Marlin, if you come to the Ender 3 folder, there's already example configurations for SKR Mini E3 1, 1 1.2 and 2.0. So all you need to do is to copy these four files and paste them into your Marlin folder and overwrite what's already there. This means all of your configuration will already be set up for the Ender 3, with the only other change occurring in platformio.ini, where we need to specify the correct build environment for this mainboard. With all of our configuration for the printer and mainboard done, all we need to do is click the tick to compile our firmware. And in around a minute, because we haven't made any changes, we should have a message telling us success. If we go inside .pio, build, and then the name of our processor, we'll find a file called firmware.bin and we copy that over to the SD card that came with the main board, pop the SD card back into the main board and the next time you power on the printer, there'll be a delay of around 5 to 10 seconds. This is the period when the firmware is updating and after that, the printer should operate as per usual. Checking the info in about printer tells us our firmware is updated as we expect. So let's make sure that our version of Marlin is correctly set up by running the same G code again. Everything is fine and now we have a suitable firmware base for later modifications. It's also worth noting that on the Big Tree Tech GitHub, there's some pre-confiled binary files. If you've got an Ender 5, this means for standard as well as two versions of BL Touch. If you're running an original CR10, it looks like you're doing it yourself. There's also two versions for the Ender 3. I tested out the base version, it seems as if it was the same firmware that came on the board and that meant the latest test print completed successfully. Just remember that if you do download one of these other versions that you need to rename the file to firmware.bin all in lowercase. The EEPROM on the previous versions of this board was something that gave some trouble, so has it been fixed? I'm pleased to report that throughout all of my testing with any version of firmware any changes that I made and then stored the settings for was persistent after a loss of power and that means the new dedicated EEPROM is working exactly as it should. The BL Touch is a very popular accessory so how do we go about setting it up? Firstly it's worth noting that as illustrated in the instructions there's a dedicated BL Touch port where they intend for you to plug in all five wires all in a row. Elsewhere in the documentation they illustrate a more traditional method where the black and white wires are plugged into the original Z end stop. I prefer this second version where the BL Touch replaces the Z end stop switch, so I set up my firmware to suit that, compiled it and flashed it to the board. Whichever method you choose, you'll need to use the LCD or a terminal to correctly set the offset of your probe from the nozzle. As your first layer goes down, you'll also need to set your Z offset for the perfect first layer. It's always worth doing a test home after you make these changes just to ensure everything is lined up and working. 
For me, the probe was working correctly, so I was able to start a test print. Once again, everything went successfully, and in just over 15 minutes, I had another clip for my collection. I also trialed the pre-compiled VL Touch firmware from the GitHub. It's designed to connect with all five wires in the Z probe port, but what it doesn't make clear is the fact that you still need your Z end stop switch plugged in. With this setup, it homes in the corner using the regular end stop switch, but then a G29 still uses the BL Touch to probe the bed. This system does work well and produced another successful print, but be warned you'll need to recalibrate your Z offset with this system to avoid damaging your bed. Another popular accessory is filament runout detection, so here's how to set it up. For my testing, I was using a simple 3-pin sensor as sold by TH3D. The wiring is really straightforward. Plug it into the E0 stop port. From left to right, it should be signal, ground, and 5 volt. In the firmware, we need to uncomment define filament runout sensor, connect to the printer, and issue an M119. This will tell us whether the printer thinks there's filament in the sensor or not, and if it's incorrect, you can toggle the inverting from false to true, or you can change it from pull up to pull down resistors. And so begins yet another test print, and you can see as soon as I pull the filament, the firmware alerts me on the LCD, moves to the side, and prompts me to unload the filament. You're then guided through loading the filament back in, and after that, the print will resume, and for me, it seemed to be quite seamless in doing so. In fact, I'd say you can't even tell where it restarted, and this clip looks as good as all the others. So how about NeoPixels and other accessories? Again, we have a dedicated port where we plug them in, and from left to right, it should be ground, signal, and 5 volts. The firmware proved more challenging. In configuration.h, you need to uncomment define NeoPixel LED, set the type, for me it was Neo underscore GRB, and then tell it the amount of pixels. The other options can be set using their informative descriptions but the firmware would not compile until I copied over the Adafruit NeoPixel section from the copy of platformio.ini on the Big Tree Tech GitHub over to my local version. I also had to do the same for everything underneath the environment, again overriding what was in my local copy of platformio.ini. Enabling the startup test is recommended because you'll see this three color pattern on boot and that tells you that everything is connected correctly with the way that I've configured it, it changes from blue to purple as the bed heats up, and then from purple to red as the extruder reaches its temperature. It will then be white during printing, and switch to green when the print is complete. Another successful test. So what about the TFT35 dual mode touchscreen? This works with no firmware changes. The grey ribbon cable goes from expansion 1 on the board to expansion 3 on the TFT, and the black serial cable plugs in as you can see here. You've been seeing me use the Marlin LCD mode the whole way through this video, but what you haven't seen is if you hold down the encoder wheel for three seconds, you can toggle back and forth between Marlin LCD and touch mode, so you can choose between a traditional or touchscreen interface. As you would expect from the same family of products, it works flawlessly with this board. The Big Tree Tech Wi-Fi module also works exactly as depicted in my previous video. Big Tree Tech now has a 24 volt version of their uninterrupted power supply. I ordered one of these at the end of March, but postage for some reason has been quite slow and I was unable to test it here. The comments on the version 1.2 video were unhappy that I left out sensorless homing, so here it is. Now the Big Tree Tech website makes a misleading claim that you can simply plug on these jumpers to enable sensorless homing. So before I changed any firmware, I tried just that. I put the jumpers in place for X and Y, and I unplugged the end stops for X and Y as well. And as expected, sensorless homing did not work, the printer just sat there grinding until I powered it off. Hardly surprising when the firmware doesn't recommend the command to tune the sensitivity. So a firmware change is required, but fortunately it's just one line. In configuration underscore ADV, we uncomment define sensorless homing. You can then adjust the sensitivity from the TMC drivers menu option and then going to sensorless homing. On an end of 3, I found a value of 50 for X and Y was spot on, 
make sure to store your settings in the EEPROM once you find the sweet spot. And as for the reprint, it turned out great as well. Overall, I'd say this board is a nice step forward and it was much smoother to get running than last time. Out of the three versions of this board that I've now tested, this one gave me the least amount of trouble in setting everything up. So well done to Big Tree Tech for improving their product based on community feedback. Another reason that things went smoothly is that the developers of Marlin had taken the time to provide example configurations for this board and that was a fantastic basis to build upon. As I make these guides, longevity is the only unknown, but given the previous two boards worked without fault and this one seems to have a lot of improvements around reliability, I expect it to go well into the future as well. If you've got any thoughts on this particular board, please let me know down below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.